welcome back to Dragonfly Engineering. So this week we've got a day job that uh, one of my customers said I could film for YouTube and it's to mold these little plastic housings. Uh, there's three kind of snouts that have a through hole on each one and then a bottom flange. So let's go ahead and look under the microscope so you can see what I'm talking about. All right, so here's the part under the microscope here, and you can see we got the two parts that make up our family mold, uh, this guy and this guy. And currently they're attached on the sprue and the gates, or I guess you could say they're little tiny runners. Uh, so what we're going to do is cut these guys off of the sprue. Again, this is the family mold parts, like so. And we'll bring this guy down. And then you can see the parts here in more detail. We'll get the, both of them in there. So let's just look at one. All right, so picking up this guy with my big old fingers. <laughs> you can see how we got three funnel type shapes here with through holes that go through the bottom of the part. So here you can see if I can capture the light. You can see the, the through holes there in the plastic and then a bottom flange to mount this thing down to something. So this is it basically three snouts, through holes, and then a, and a plastic flange, and then it's, its cousin over here. So those two are going to be molded simultaneously on the mold that we're going to make right now in the shop. Uh, this will probably be two episodes, maybe, hard to say, maybe three episodes, depends on how much footage I capture. Okay, so this is the 3D model of the part that we're, that we're molding. And the other one, which is color-coded green, looks very similar to this. So we're just going to look at this pink-purplish one right now. So in the CAD system, uh, one thing you got to do is increase the scale factor uh, because plastic shrinks when you mold it in the mold. So you got to like make your model slightly bigger. And then you set up a parting line, and this blue line basically says where the mold's going to open. Uh, it's the demarcation between the two mold halves. Next step is shut off surfaces and you add these little surfaces here so that the CAD system knows you know these are going to be through holes so put a temporary thin surface there. Uh, next step is the parting surface which is this surface right here and this surface basically defines the bigger area of the mold halves as they separate. And then finally you you actually wrap a a solid mold around your part. So if we go over and look at one of the components, so we've got two mold halves here highlighted in blue and if I isolate this one then you'll see how we've got the inverse shape of our part here and and then what we're gonna do is machine this shape into the mold. So if we go to the assembly mode, so the same purplish part is right here inside of the mold this guy right there and you can see some of the action so there's the other half of the mold which is this these basically these posts up here and then the corresponding green version or the second part in the family mold is over here so similar so the function of this mold is to have kind of a two-step operation so this this guy is the a side that i've highlighted and if you look at our little mold inserts these are going to be machined out of tool steel and you can see here how the the features on the A side which is the side that the plastic squirts in through this hole right here are pretty simple and you want the more simple features on the side of the mold that you don't want the parts to stick on which is usually the, the A side but you can see we've got two steel blocks these are actually going to be one block uh, but for demonstration I've color coded the two different features and then the outer aluminum block is going to be this guy which I've highlighted sort of in blue there these are alignment bearings and then alignment shafts for the bottom half of the mold. So getting back to the bottom half of the mold where more interesting stuff is going on. These are the corresponding mold inserts that we just showed in the single part. And this brown plate here is called a stripper plate. So I actually split the, the mold block into two pieces. So this piece here, if you can see through, has just a bunch of basically through hole features. So this creates the outer wall of the snouts. And then on the bottom half of the mold, below the stripper plate, are the actual cones that create the through holes and then the base blocks of aluminum or steel, uh, which are housed in this this aluminum base here. Let me change this transparency. 
So, anyway, so, so the stripper plate, basically, its purpose is to pull the intricate plastic parts off of the core pins, which are existing down inside here. And to do that, we've got these, these red springs here. So these springs are compressed when the mold closes. So you can imagine this mold block closes, like so. And then this stripper plate is actually pushed down into its cavity, and these springs are pushing this, the plate back up. So when the mold opens, the springs push this plate up, which kind of strips the plastic parts off of these core pins. And this helps with the, you know, reducing the stress of the part ejecting. So in the up position with the stripper plate, which is going to be about here, the next thing that happens, with the, which the molding machine does, is actuates what's called the ejector plate, which is down here at the bottom. So when you push the ejector plate, the ejector pins push up because all these, all these steel pins are attached to this plate. And you can see how this plate slides on this alignment shaft that goes through the whole mold. Okay, so let's go back to the shop and start making this thing. Okay, so I'm going to use this A2 tool steel. This is a kneeled bar, which is 5 eighths by one and a half inch. And we're going to cut some one inch pieces off of this. And, th and these, these pieces will be the base material for our two main inserts in the mold. Uh, each insert is going to have a cavity for the two different parts in the family mold. The horizontal saw gets the worst coolant in the shop. Every, it, all the coolant goes down to the saw. Or, demoted to the saw. I apologize for the background noise. Most of the mills are running in the background right now. And we are gonna square these blocks up to one and a half inches by one inch by five eighths of an inch because that is the ideal size for our mold inserts. So this is just gonna be a quick, easy sanity check. I'm gonna hold the block down against a one, two, three block. And then just run the I'm kind of putting some pressure on the block so I'm not inducing the air. And we'll see if the needle moves. It looks like it's staying within a thousandths or actually probably three ten thousandths. So I'm going to do a quick vice square check on, on the TM1 mill. Just jog across and see what we get. All right, looks like it's good. At the end of my test, I like to wiggle the indicator a little bit to make sure that it's actually touching. You know, because you can dial across something and think you're the greatest machinist in the world, but the, if the probe's not actually touching, then, then yeah, not so much. So always check that it's in contact at the end of your, of your squareness check. All right, so I'm going to set up with the little origin that we found over on the granite to be the reference bottom corner. I've already put the parallels in here and cleaned the, the surfaces. And we're just going to stick this block out a little bit. Tighten her down. Let me clear the area so I can get this hammer in here. So we'll just tap our stock down a little bit. And I tap on the handle. And then we test that our parallels are flat and don't wiggle. Feels like. This one could use a little bit. Yeah, so they're nice and seated. And the vise is set. So now we can go ahead and start squaring up our mold inserts. And all we're doing right now is just squaring up the end of the stock relative to that known good corner. So I'm just manually moving this mill around. And I'm just looking for a clean face. I'm just basically machining off the Bands all marks. We're doing a combination of climb and conventional milling, and basically we're just machining off the the tool flex that happens when you whenever you machine anything. The mill flexes, the tool flexes, everything flexes. Okay, so I flipped the stock around and I've already faced off some of the bulk of this insert block. So let's go ahead and measure where we're at. Okay. Usually your lowest number is the accurate number because that means you're most squared up. So we'll take two thousandths off this guy and then we will be ready to cut the second insert. I like to do it a couple of times just to maximize squareness. I'm also using the top of a end mill uh, which has cleaner, less used flutes as opposed to the bottom of the end mill which you know usually is 
the bottom of an end mill is what wears out first. So these end mills are nice to keep when you're doing facing like this. All right, so the final operation is we need to take four thousandths off the end of this quote unquote precision ground steel stock because uh, it's four thousandths oversized. Maybe they just sell it oversized. I'm not sure, but anyway, it's, it's not precision one and a half inches, that's for certain. <laughs> so I'll skim off a little bit here. I don't think I took much of anything. Uh, Two thousandths, and we'll see what happens here. That way I can measure and then dial in. I also have the, the mill stop set up on this mill, as you can see in the background. In fact, I should probably flip the stock around and get rid of any residual out of squareness from the off the shelf grind. So maybe I'll do that. One second. Take a tear the thin mills off, of course. I'll slap that up against our mill stop. This should be one and a half thousandths. And the size of this block is important because the bearings that align the front and back of the... Oh, actually it looks like there's a little bit of a squareness issue there. Anyway, the bearings that align the front and back, or the two, the, the A and the B side of the mold, are on the aluminum insert, and then these, or the aluminum frame, and then these inserts are going to be referenced to that aluminum frame. I'm pretty sure that the flat stock is actually ground to 5 eighths of an inch, but I'll measure that next to make sure. But we can always machine that off in the 3D machining operation in the Herco mills. Okay, we'll pull the tool out of there. And since we've got our stop here, I can just pull this stock out and measure it off camera. All right, looks good. All right, we're ready to load these blanks into the two mills and start cutting the 3D profiles. So we're gonna set up our tools for the B-side insert. We've got this new four flute eighth inch end mill here. And we will stick this guy into the ER16 collet. So uh, to load a collet, you stick the collet into the nose first or to the nut first and it kind of contains in there. There's a retaining ring, which also is used to eject the collet back out. And then you screw the collet onto the tool holder. And then you put the tool in. Tighten it down. Some people say use a torque wrench, but I just tighten to the amount that I always do, which is about like that. And there you go. There's our first tool. And then here's the second tool. It's already loaded. I've, I've already been using this three flute carbide quarter inch end mill. So the quarter inch is gonna do the roughing out of the outer perimeter of our, of our mold insert. And then the eighth inch actually can do the rest of the detail inside. We don't need to get smaller end mills which is fortunate. Okay, let's go ahead and load these tools into the mill. This Herco has a 20 tool holder magazine and it's a swing arm style tool holder. So we'll just tap this guy in, you know, tap down on the handle, make sure we're nice and seated and then I always check the parallels so that one's moving. Okay, that's tight. We do this a few times to make sure we're seated well. So to set this tool, we're going to basically touch off the tool off of the, the area of stock that I know that we're gonna machine away later. So I do a lot of visual touch off. So actually we're gonna go over to an area that I know that is gonna be free of final features. So I typically use these, these optical loops, basically just an eyepiece with a simple lens in the end. And, I, and you can look at the end of your end mill actually pretty far away. So my, my eye is maybe a foot and a half away and I'm focused in on the end mill right now, which is nice. So there's other types of loops that you gotta get it right up on your eye, but this style, if you can find it, it's only like three or four dollars, it's all plastic. You can set your tool optically, even though you're like two feet away from the end mill. So let's go ahead and do that process. So I'll bring the tool down. And what I'm doing is I'm looking for first cut. 
on the surface. And this is a safe area of the, of the mold insert because it's all gonna be machined away anyway. So we can actually hit and then back off a little bit. So I'm coming down at uh, 10 microns per click on the dial over here. Or about half a thousandth. There we go, so that was first touch. We're gonna back off 20 microns or a little, about eight tenths. I'm gonna move around and yeah, we're still cutting. So I'll come up another 10 microns. Okay, so now we're not cutting. And again, this is a safe area of the mold insert. So I'm gonna stop drop, start dropping the tool down by one, one micron at a time. I think that's good. And I am going to actually run this tool across to see how we're looking. See, it could be the stock is not square on, on thickness, which I think is the case. But as long as our tool can cut all the way across the top of the stock, then we're setting it to be square. Because as I mentioned before, this pre-ground stock is definitely not accurate. <laughs> so the next tool that we're gonna set is tool number three, which is the eighth inch end mill. Change tools to tool number three. And then we can bring this tool down and set its height. Basically with the same technique. Cool. There, I saw first touch. I think I'll back off. That's it, so we're gonna do, we're gonna set this tool length. Another thing to keep in mind is that when you do a tool change, you're probably gonna lose a couple of microns on height anyway. But yeah, you can, I can see the, the polish of the eighth inch end mill on that surface. Maybe you can too. So now what we're gonna do is essentially just move this guy to the back of our stock. Then we bring the ball down below the surface of our stock, being careful not to touch the top of the vise. And then we basically just bring Y forward and we're watching the needle on the, on the dial here. The red needle should go to zero. And what we're doing is we're, we're flexing that ball out by the radius of the ball until we get to zero. Now with this one, it seems like if the top black needle is, is a little bit past zero, it seems to be like two ticks past zero is the setup for this one. I'm sure I could calibrate this, but this is how I checked it. I didn't fuss with moving the zero around. You can set up work coordinates all over this table and each work coordinate system, the, the mill will say that's the, the, the center of its work, which is kind of nice. You can array projects and stuff. In my case, I've got different fixtures with a known position of, of them. All right, so let's go ahead and set our work here to G54. The flexed position, you see how I'm going positive and, and getting closer to the red. If I keep moving in the wrong direction, I'll break off the tip. There's like a breakaway ceramic tip there. So I'm gonna back out away. And I don't have to do a tool offset because the flexing tip takes care of that. And we're gonna go over to X. And then we can do the same thing again. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit start. And I got my finger on the feed hold button if something doesn't look like it's gonna work out well. Okay, we got our quarter inch tool coming in. You can speed up the rapid a little bit and then I'll slow it down as it starts to get close to the stock. Okay, that looks good. Listen for the good entry. I'll turn the coolant on so we don't overheat our tool. And there we go. We are cutting. Let me zoom you in. So this is A2 tool steel in the annealed state. 
cutting our mold insert. Okay, so the program finished uh, doing the rough cutting out of the shape and then the radial 3D profiling of all of those pins that you see on the surface. I did a, or when we did machine those radial pins, I actually added stock to leave on the, on the part such that we could go back and do a final finish cut. Sometimes when the radial machining happens on delicate pins like that, the, the pin will actually flex a little bit and cause a gouge mark into the pin. So we're doing a, like a two-stage rough finish and then a final finish. So this next finish is, has a much finer step over. Uh, I think it's a 1,000 step over as it's going up and down the shaft of the pin or the, all of those pins. So this machining operation, this final finish, 3D profiling, a, kind of a spoke pattern 3D profiling, uh, which is to a true size for the pin uh, will take most of the night. So I'm going to start this up and then we will just let it run overnight by itself. Okay, so I'm going to hit the start button and it'll fire up. And there we go. So it's machining 35 microns off of the surface that it just machined. And it's going at 150 millimeters per minute or about five inches per minute. I'll reduce it down. That was an interesting sound. Oh, I think that was the coolant turning on. <laughs> yeah, I set the coolant automatic so that at the end of the night, probably three in the morning or something, uh, when the spindle cooldown sequence starts, it'll turn off the coolant. Because uh, when you let the spindle run high RPM for a long time, it's best to have a cooldown sequence so that your bearings don't get jammed up by it the turning off hot and then cooling down and, and clinching up on the bearing. So it's like a 20 minute or a 10 minute slow down process that I program into the end of the program. And that's it. So about four or five hours later, it will be done. <laughs>
All right, I found this piece of stock. It looks like maybe a cold rolled bar of 4140, but I'm not sure, uh, steel. It looks like I plasma cut it at some point, but this stock we're gonna use for the stripper plate, which is the final cavity component of our mold, and this plate is gonna basically pull the, the molded parts off of all the delicate pins on the A side of the mold. So to do that, we need to, oh, and our mold is gonna, is six inches wide, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna rough cut out maybe 6.1 inches off of this stock in the saw, and then we're gonna load it in the Haas mill, and I've got a series of hole drills and pocketing to get basically this thing ready for our cavity machining. So let's go ahead and do that. When you're milling cold rolled material, or actually most materials that, that has any strength to it, you risk warping the stock because a lot of times there's stresses on the skins of these metal bars. So if you come in and you start machining down through the stress layer on the surface from the, from the work hardening operation from cold rolling, then when you, when you pull your part out of the vise, it curls up on you because the other side of the bar still has the original stress in it. So I'm only gonna take a tiny bit off here and probably wind up grinding the back, which is still relieving stress, but it's a little bit of a risk to play around with, with planing off steel. There we go. I think I'll speed it up. Probably keep the coolant going. So we just get a nice, good, planar surface on this steel, hopefully. So I'm checking the, the fly cut surface of that stock that I just machined. I did a light orbital sand on it, and it looks like it's still flat. It does the, the little air vacuum, not right there, but if I'm gentle, then it does that kind of clap sound where it's where there's an air cushion. That's a good indication that you're reasonably flat. If I really let it go, then you'll start to hear it ring. But I can also feel a little bit of a vacuum when I pull the part up too. So that's a good sign that it's it's pretty flat. All right, so I loaded the stock back in the vise, and this is the side that we machined with the half inch end mill. And then here's the top surface that we shell milled, and I just checked flatness on. So the CNC program is actually gonna cut this surface over here to six inches. So I set this edge in a little bit from the vise because this is a six inch jaw, so I should just come along and skim this surface with the half inch end mill in the CNC program. Uh, so let's go ahead and find this zero location. The program zero is set right here at the back corner. And I'm gonna load tool number 10, which is the edge finder. M6T10 on the MDI page, and then cycle start. Then we'll tell it to spend the 1200 RPM, which is what I like to do for edge finding. And then manually I'll jog this guy over and we're gonna find the back edge and the left edge, or the back left corner of this stop. And then I'm gonna come down and touch off and basically find the top surface of this, this steel plate here. I'm in metric mode. There it is. So we'll back up a few microns. And then we'll go left and right. We are taking off a little material. I took three more microns off, or about one and a half tenths. They're still cutting. I mean, the surface finish of this steel isn't great either, so maybe cutting off the peaks and, and leaving the valleys. I'll bring it down a few more and then the rest will be spindle growth from heat. Tool offset measure, so I think we are set. 
So I'm gonna load up the program and then we'll get this thing going. Okay, there's our program. So we start with the standard drill with the center drill, which is tool five, and it goes down through all the tools and the operations that we just programmed. I'm gonna set the rapid to 5%, which is always a good practice. We can go back to the main screen and I am going to hit start. And I'm gonna have my finger on the hold, feed hold button to make sure nothing bad happens. And that's it, let me get you back onto the milling operation. Let me zoom out. So the program is executing, but it's at 5% rapid right now, so I can be fussing with this camera. Uh, then when I hit 100% rapid, then it'll go a lot faster. And it changes out the tool to our center drill. And then when, it's, when the center drill starts to get close, I'm gonna slow down the rapid and be ready on the feed hole. Because you never know how bad you screwed up. <laughs> we'll get the coolant going. Looks like it's happy. I can zoom you in on this. Okay, and then I'll go back to 100%. Show you some of the tool change action. And then this tool is gonna come over and face off the end of our stock, so save us one step in the manual stock setup. Let's zoom in on that. Okay, and that's the end of that tool. Here is our smaller drill bit, which is also gonna be the, the lead hole for that large half inch drill bit, which may be too small. But this steel doesn't seem too rough. And this is the last tool. So there the, the end mill plunged down the center of that drilled hole and it was pretty happy. I think I got the speed up. I really got it too high now. Oh, well, maybe not. I think this is pretty mild steel. Okay, we're set up over on the Haas mill to finish the stripper plate profile. So this is gonna drill the through holes for the mold features, the mold cavities themselves, and th uh, course, or rough out the shape of the two mold cavities and then do the final 3D raster profile cutting in a kind of a crosshatch pattern. We can speed up the process here. So right now we're center drilling all the little pilot holes for the, for the snouts of our plastic parts. So I'm roughing out a lot of the steel with just drilled holes, and then we're gonna come back with the micro machining with a 1 16th end mill to 3D profile everything. All right, I got some 7075 billet blocks here. These are six inches square by two inches thick and it's high strength aluminum. And this is gonna be the, essentially the, the base that's gonna hold our inserts. So I'm gonna machine a pocket here in the middle that, uh, that our inserts will then slip into. And then the you know, alignment bearing holes and mounting to the bottom of the, the mold riser and base block that houses the ejector pins and stuff. So I think this block will be the B side. 
for actually, well, the A side just finished, so this will be the A side receiver. So let's go ahead and load it up. I've already checked the parallels that they're clean and flat. Let me tap this block in. Okay, we're gonna use this three inch shell mill with these round carbide inserts, which makes a really good finish because the basically the scallop height, which usually affects the, the finish, is this entire round surface here. Oh, and when you're inserting a tool, there's a button on the side of the, of the spindle housing that, that you hit to open up the tool clamp and then grab the tool. And the heights of these blocks is not critical, especially for like a fast rapid, rapid prototype mold like we're doing. So I'm just gonna come down and essentially machine off the, the foundry surface of this aluminum. There we go, they retouched. So move off an X. And then we'll drop down another you know, 100 microns or so. And I'm just gonna hold down the jog button. So we're moving Y first to get a, a decent exposure. And then go across. Sounds like we started to finish cut on the Haas mill over there. That was that change in RPM. Okay, so now what we wanna do is find a corner on this aluminum block. So we're setting up the tools for the A-side aluminum base, and I figured this would be a good opportunity for me to show you what I'm seeing when I'm using that little inspection loop, uh, the, the eye inspection optic to set tools. So I set the uh, dyno light camera up here, which basically emulates the view that I see, or you could just do, use a dyno light as well to set the tool heights. So I've got the video recording on the laptop right here. And I'm gonna show you basically how I set the tool. So if you see how you can see the tip of the flute here and then the reflection of the tip of the flute of this, of this three flute end mill in the surface that we just machined. And essentially what I do is I just slowly bring the tool down until the gap between the, the flute tip and the reflection of the flute tip goes to zero. It's a little fuzzy to see right now, but right now I'm dropping down 10 microns at a time, and we can switch down to one micron at a time. If I would have spent more time getting the focus just right on this dyno light, we'd be able to probably see the one micron increments better. But right now I'm going one micron at a time, and you can also you know, move the tool and look for a first witness scratch. You can see the kind of the scallop height from the previous shell mill cut. And right now I'm manually moving the tool back and forth, concentrating on this, the tip of this flute. Now keep in mind that flutes on the tip of end mills have a negative rake, so the outermost radius has the highest point on the tool. So what we're looking at is for first scratch or visual gap going to zero. So you can see a slight gap there. So I'm bringing down a few more microns. I'm basically clicking one micron per like little move of the tool here. And we're looking for the first, first indication of a slice. There, uh, that little white pixel right there was our first cut. So we are, let me go one micron more. One, okay, so that, that was one micron's worth of cut. So we, if we go back up one micron, then we should be able to shave off our little chip there and we're back to not cutting again. So let's, let's move that chip out of the way. Okay, so this tells us that we are basically within a micron or so. Now this is only valid at the temperature of this mill when we set the tool. So since the spindle is gonna spin up, I'm gonna go ahead and set the tool height here. And then on Z, we're gonna raise up by 10 microns. So that was 10 microns because we're gonna be spinning at about three to 4,000 RPM. So my experience is about 10 microns is gonna grow in three to 4,000. 
So anyway, that's how we set the tool height. Or that's how I do it. Uh, now a lot of times I'm using a little optic instead of the Dynalite, but the Dynalite works too, it's just more fuss. And it's a little more tricky and dangerous because you got a cable in there next to your spindle. All right, so we're ready to run this program, but let me pull the 3 16 end mill off of the surface. You, always, you, you don't really want to start a program with a tool close to the stock. So we'll say Z plus. And yeah, we've got a drill for drilling some pilot holes and some pilot holes for some M3 mounting holes, and then the 3 16 end mill. So let's go ahead and hit go. And off to the races. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to run over to the other Herco where we are working on the B-side mold insert. So now we're going to drill and counter bore the mounting holes and the center sprue, or actually the center ejector hole for this, this mold insert, which has all the pins and things for the two plastic parts. Hi folks. All right, so now what we're gonna do is drill on these, these little pilot holes here with a half inch drill bit and then machine out the pocket for our linear sleeve bearings, which are these guys right here. This is an, an aluminum purchased linear bearing with, with a rule on, or sometimes they're a, a Teflon, a, a special liner in here that basically helps prevent binding up. Then we'll test the fit. So what we're looking for is a light press fit. And this actually is dropping right in there. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's okay. And this guy, but it'll probably tighten up at the bottom. I added 10 microns to the radius, but I guess this, this end mill was ground a little big. So, all right, well, it's starting to tighten up at the base. And I made the hole deeper, so I think once I, basically with, with flexure and cutting, the bottom of your CNC milled hole is usually a smaller diameter than the top. So we have an extremely slight taper in that hole. So now that it's in there, let me see if I can tap it in a little bit. Let's see if I can seat this guy. All right, I think we're set. So another trick I can do is to either peen this edge over the, of the pocket so that the insert can't slide back out when the mold heats up, or I can also get a drill center, like a, a spring-loaded punch, and start pinging the, peening the inside diameter closer to where the insert settled in, and that will prevent it from pulling out as well. So actually looking at this other insert, I tried pressing it in, and it... It needs a decent amount of human force to get it down in there. So that's actually even probably more ideal. So sometimes with these inserts, because uh, typically these inserts have half a thousandth or, 10 mic or 12 micron clearance from the shaft to the liner. And if you press too hard, if you press these inserts in into a undersized hole, then the entire radius or the, the entire diameter constricts. You can't get your shaft in there anymore. And in this case, for some reason, this guy over here is a little bit looser than, than this guy. So th when the mold goes together, this is gonna be the lead reference sleeve and alignment shaft, and this one will follow. Because theoretically, you can't get two perfectly uh, zero tolerance shafts to align together because they're, they're gonna fight each other. Okay, so this is the A-side mold insert, and we've got these M3 screws here 
got maybe too much stick out on the bottom. Can you see that? Yeah. So what we're going to do now is basically insert this guy into our mold body. Make sure it's nice and clean in there. And this can be a little tricky at times. Actually, sometimes it's good to stick some oil on it. Because with a tight fit, any kind of angular misalignment can cause these, these parallel surfaces to jam up with actually a lot of force. So by lubing them up, it helps prevent the, the locking in of these edges. And there we're starting to feel some resistance. I'm not sure what that is. Or I'm just starting to lock in. Yeah, this popping thing that happens left to right is indicative. Are we in focus? Yeah. All right, so let me get the uh, rubber mallet. So with the high precision fit, it, it's, it's already jammed in there. So you got to start finding where the edge jams and then overcome it and try to knock the, the part back square again. Seems like, oh, there we go. Sometimes you can hear it too when it decides to free up. Okay, so now the screws are starting to become proud. Okay. I think we are bottomed. So now we'll go in and screw this guy down. Uh, and I have equal amounts of metric and English screw or uh, hex keys, which can be a source of continual delay and frustration. I'm going to screw this down like it's a head on an engine or something. Kind of cross screwing or cross tightening. So here we're drilling out the center sprue hole with the eighth inch drill and we're chasing the steel hole in the in the insert block such that we can get down to the aluminum which we just hit there and the main purpose of this is just to drill a hole all the way through this aluminum block let me get the coolant going and i use a long drill bit because in the past i've wound up running out of drill bit space and, and screwed up my mold surface with the drill chuck. So now I put a really long drill bit in there so that I know that I'm gonna, not gonna mess up the drill chuck. And we're just drilling aluminum, so it's pretty safe. Okay, now we're gonna load the tapered drill bit. Now this is our tapered drill, which creates the tapered sprue. The, basically the hole where the plastic flows into the mold needs to be tapered so that it'll release and pull out of the mold when the part ejects. If this was a square drilled hole in the mold only, then the entire surface would be wedged in with injection molded plastic. So with a taper, all of the plastic kind of breaks free from the surface all at once. The downside is drill with drilling a tapered drill is the entire face of the drill bit is cutting at the same time. So there's a, a lot of torsion force on the drill bit and you can break these off easily. So I'll show you how we can prevent that. The trick with drilling this tapered drill, at least that I've discovered, is that the drill peck, which is the amount of material you remove per cycle of pecking, is only about 75 microns or 3 thousandths of an inch, which doesn't seem like a whole lot at the beginning and it seems to take forever because it's just slowly pecking. But as the drill gets deeper and deeper the, and the entire tapered face of the drill is cutting all at once by only cutting about three thousandths per peck and then clearing out the, the material, you save the drill uh, so that it doesn't twist off and break in the chuck, ideally, unless the drill starts to get old. So this will take a while, maybe 20 minutes or so. So we'll do a little bit of time lapse of this operation. Well, this looks like a good point to stop for this week uh, as we watch the time lapse of the drill pecking occur. Uh, next week we are going to finish machining the components of the mold and assemble the mold with all the ejector pin cutting and the assembly of the springs and the bearings and everything. Followed by that, 
probably another show afterwards, we are going to load the finished mold onto the injection molding machine and dial in the molding of these plastic parts to get the molding machine to run fully automatic. And a sneak peek in the future, it, it molds, the molding machine molded one part every 30 seconds, I think, or 20 seconds, something like that. Anyway, so please stay tuned to next week where we continue to build this mold and start molding parts. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already, and I look forward to seeing you next week. All right, bye. Well, the B side of the mold is still cutting, but I'm heading out for the night, so I'll see you all in the morning.